What's up everybody, I'm MedicMX and welcome to my channel. I'm back and I brought a freaking check 12. Yes, this is the very first one-to-one -one replica of the legendary Russian 50 cal subsonic CQB battle rifle, also known as Ash 12. And if you are a fellow gamer nerd, you probably also know it as Odin from Call of Duty. By the way, if you're an SF manufacturer and you want me to create an equally cool intro and test video like this one for one of your guns, hit me up. You find the email down in the video description. I'm only interested into Russian guns though. The Shack 12 is an incredibly fascinating and interesting gun. Back in the late 2000s, the Russian FSB requested a close quarter battle rifle that is capable of surpassing body armor and hard targets has some immense stopping power, but it won't endanger any civilians around after the bullet has done its job, which is killing the terrorist. The Shack 12 shoots an absolute pinecone of a round in the caliber 12.7 by 55 millimeter. There are multiple different types of ammo available for the Shack, like subsonic bullets, armor piercing ones, or like the left one with an aluminum tip for maximum flash damage. And these are dummies I made from massive brass, true respects though, but those are not actual life rounds. Some of you might recognize some similarities to another absolutely crazy rifle made by the Russians, the VKS Wichlop sniper rifle. And yes, it's made by the same designer and it shoots a very similar but a longer bullet. You have to understand this is an incredibly rare weapon, which only sees a very, very limited use by the FSB. And yes, there's even a ref of that available on a calendar, I believe, actually. So around 2010, the first prototypes of the back then Ash 12 appeared in public. Of course, the first prototypes of the Ash 12 did differ quite a bit from the modern shack I have in my hands right here. From these prototypes then developed the second generation of Ash, which we also know for example from the video game Escape from Tarkov. Around 2017, the Ash developed further into the shack 12. Quite a few things changed. For example, the charging handle geometry, the magazines, the magazine shield and some levers and buttons and most notably we got another vent hole near the front of the gun at the barrel. So around the year 2020 a long-haired nerd was playing Escape from Tarkov. That's me. And immediately I fell in love with this absolutely crazy gun. So I wanted one as airsoft version but I already knew that there are no replicas available except for one very crude replica made by Anti-Sniper Custom Works of the very early prototypes of the Ash. So I was like, well, let's try to build one. And little spoiler, I did. I created crazy shit all my life, but this was something different. This was a project of such complexity that I had to plan pretty much everything ahead. And that is something I rarely do. That is literally the story of my life. Regarding my background, pretty much all my skills are self-taught. Over the last couple of years, I accumulated a very nice workshop that is well equipped, but is also nothing too special. There I have a wide variety of tools available, except for anything CNC or automated related. What the fuck? <laughs> so yeah, I don't have any access to, for example, a computer controlled lathe or milling machine or whatever. And who knows, maybe you're watching this video with the intent to create your own airsoft rifle from scratch. And that brings me to my next point. How do you do that? And my biggest point for that is you need some kind of access to a 3D software, programming software or engineering software. Otherwise, you simply won't be able to plan everything out in uh, such a complexity. Yes, I am sure a studied engineer can also do that without any problems on paper, but for the random Andy like you and me, uh, yeah, you need to plan everything in, in a 3D environment, definitely. In my case, I use Blender, which I taught myself over the last couple of years, actually. This, combined with a basic knowledge in machining, allows for a project like this. So you want to build your own gun, but how do you actually start? So first of all, you need an overall layout of the gun to understand its dimensions and measurements, which can be kind of tricky if you're trying to build a very rare gun of which only a handful of pictures exist. But as I mentioned, I am an Escape from Tarkov gamer nerd 
and these guys built their 3D models to an incredible accuracy. So basically I extracted the in-game model and I had all the measurements I need to get an idea about the complete dimension of the gun. And yeah, from here on out I was able to yeah, pretty much scale everything from the model I had. With the measurements I was able to create a very detailed 3D model of my own and I was able to determine on what engine to build this gun on. Because of the bullpup design, the amount of gearboxes I could use was very limited. In the end I decided to go the same route as anti-sniper and use a machine gun, the PKM gearbox. It's a machine gun. <laughs> machine okay. gun. They just fit perfectly for this gun and they are super sturdy, can handle a high rate of fire and they are so comfortable and nice and easy to work on. And no, before I use a HBA line I rather drive a nail through my foot. I fucking hate these things. And if you plan to build your own airsoft guns, make sure to check back with your local law. In my case, for example, we have very strict gun laws, but I am still allowed to build airsoft guns to a certain amount of muscle energy or muscle velocity. Which is sadly not that much, but it's good enough for my purpose because I wanted to build this gun as CQB monster pretty much anyway. And if I want to, I can give this gun to a certified gunsmith who then changes the spring, increases the energy, sends the gun to the authorities, who then certify it, and yeah, we have some very retarded gun laws. If you have your hopes up to see a GBB Shack 12 on my channel at some point, I won't let you down. I'm actually planning on something like that. Basically, you have to build the gun around an existing certified gun. That sounds complicated, but it's very much possible and not that difficult. It's just important that you don't change any relevant parts of the main gun. But anyway, yeah, like I said, uh, retarded loss, but I plan on something like that as well. So anyway, I knew on what engine I wanted to build this gun on. And from here on out, I just started programming and 3D modeling, prototyping and whatnot. And this process took roughly two years. I then pretty much 3D printed the complete gun to verify its sizing and the dimensions. Then it was time to start the actual manufacturing and I began with uh, the upper receiver. I took a piece of sheet metal, cut it to size, measured and marked out all the holes that needed to be done and cut and drilled out and this is what I proceeded to do. Usually receivers like these are stamped from sheet metal. Stamping requires a tremendous amount of force and you need to machine stamping dies. Of course that was out of question. Uh, another method is a bending bench, uh, which I also don't have. <laughs> In the end, I decided to make a very straight cut with the angle grinder along the line where the edge is supposed to be. Uh, to weaken the material at this point, I didn't cut through the material but like 2 millimeters into the 3 millimeter steel. And then I clamped the whole thing up and beat the crap out of it with a mullet. The mullet ensured no damage to the material and I was able to get some very crisp lines as you can see. And here comes the most complicated part about the whole build, this area right here. Again, if you have a 80 ton hydraulic press and stamping dies, that is no problem at all. But without those, it's nearly impossible to get an even bend like this out of one piece if you bend the whole sheet metal part. So basically my plan was to completely cut out this area right here, mill out the slots for the venting holes and this little one, re the whole thing after I'm done with that and grind everything flush. This was the plan. And this is where the biggest fuck up of the whole build happened. I completely underestimated the amount of warpage I'll get uh, while welding the pieces in. Especially when working with sheet metal, the material moves a lot. You have to be very even and super careful with your heat, which I was not. So I welded up the complete first side and then I noticed that the whole upper third of the receiver walked towards the side I was welding on. It looked like someone took it and smacked it across his knee. So while looking on top of the receiver, you have to imagine that pretty much this complete area was tilted like this. I was hoping to fix this by welding up the other side so that the material would get drawn back into its original shape. But that was not the case, it just got worse and the whole complete receiver twisted pretty much on itself. This is something nearly impossible to fix, uh, but I tried for seven days in which I lost three kilograms body weight because I literally lived in the workshop and did nothing but welding and sanding. In the end, I got a little bit angry and I maybe took a hammer and yeah. Yeah, this is version one. 
It's important to note that at this point I was actually building an Ash 12 and not a Shack. So after a short mental break, I decided to retry, but I always preferred the Shack look a little bit more, which made me reworking the whole 3D model and uh, go to work again. So I did everything again, but this time I tried to be as precise as possible with uh, the cutouts. I made a spacer for the inside of the upper receiver and I tack welded the whole thing to a massive piece of steel so that the material has pretty much nowhere to go. But even then, you have to be super careful. I worked with very, very little heat, but yeah, this time I was able to make this thing look good. So let's take a little look inside the gun. This assembling the gun is extremely easy. You just push out this pin here, which secures the handguard into place. I already pre-pushed it from the other side. You just pull it and you can remove the complete handguard like this. On the original, the gun has a bottom plate here with another Picatinny rail where the handguard slides on. I decided against that feature to have easy access to the barrel and quick lock mechanism I will show you later on. Further, it gives me more room for the battery which sits in the handguard. And all the extra space for big batteries is a nice feature of course. Now you just flip this little lever right here downwards and the whole gun comes apart. The next thing I made was the muscle device locking mechanism slash barrel assembly. They retreat the pin that secures the barrel attachment. And this was the other very complicated part about this build because I wanted it to work exactly like the original. Um, it's a combined piece which allows the small suppressor and the flash hider to be mounted with the quick lock mechanism while the long suppressor is screwed on and then secured with the same pin. The next thing I made was the lower receiver. This part is mainly made from plastics and there isn't really a good way to make these except 3D printing. So yeah, this is 3D printed from nylon, from an FDM printer, which was then reinforced with some epoxy resin. And yeah, this thing is absolutely sturdy. Uh, you might wonder how I achieved this surface. Hand sanding. Days worth of hand sanding. The levers are made with a combination of milling and free hand filing. And just to give you guys a little idea, this little lever right here, the fire mode selector. It took me eight hours to make that thing. The safety simply blocks the trigger and is ambidextrous. Please understand that I don't want to show the inside of the lower because there are some secrets I want to keep. Um, same goes for the barrel attachment locking mechanism. So let's take a closer look at the upper receiver. As you can see, the internals are kept extremely simple and easy to reach. The trigger box is held in with two pins. The trigger itself is spring-loaded and engages in the same kind of electrical switch uh, as you can find on the PKM gearbox. As you can see, I went with an AK hop-up chamber. So yes, right now you still need to disassemble the gun to reach the hop-up. Um, but I have already developed a lever extension which will allow me to adjust the hop-up through the ejection port after moving the uh, mock bolt out of the way, of course. As you can tell, the gun is 99% uh, done, but I'm still tinkering around with uh, some improvements. The barrel is a 6.03 tight bore Prometheus uh, one, combined with a 50 degrees marble leaf flat hop. I designed the hop-up chamber base as guide for the mock bolt and socket for the spring guide rod. By the way, all the springs you see here are also made by me. I bent them from spring steel with the help of my lathe. So, let's take a closer look at the gearbox, shall we? As I said earlier, the country I live in has some pretty retarded laws and everything above 0.5 joule is considered a weapon and is only allowed in a semi-automatic fire mode. Only a certified gunsmith would be allowed to build these guns. Everything below 0.5 Joule, on the other hand, is considered a toy and can be built by people like me. And most importantly, these guns can be also automatic. So, switching this gun to semi-automatic takes away the only real advantage you have over a semi-gun with more power, which is the rate of fire. 
I built this gun with the same intent as its real counterpart, to be a CQB powerhouse with little value uh, when it comes to range. Which brings me to all the advantages of this gearbox type. First of all, look at it. It looks like it was developed for this gun. Want to remove the gearbox? Just remove these two screws here. Unplug. And here you go. The gearbox shell is a CNC one made by Retro Arms and I will show you now what's inside of it. Inside we find 13 to 1 SHS gears, an ASG Infinity CNC Custom Airsoft AEG motor with 45k RPM and all the other shenanigans that make a gun go pew pew pew. It also adds to the necessary weight to get closer to the real weight of the gun which is uh, about 5.8 kilograms on the real one and mine is about 100 gram lighter. I removed a little bit of material on the gearbox to allow room for the magazines. And the magazines are also 3D printed from ABS like resin and house the inlays of AUG magazines. Those happen to meet all the requirements uh, I had during designing the interaction in between gearbox, hop-up chamber and magazines. The mock bolt is a 3mm thick piece of steel in which I milled the cutaway that engages with the dust cover pretty much in the same way as an AR bolt. My dust cover is milled while the Reesty one is stamped, but again that would require a hydraulic press and dies to do. Working out all the measurements and welding these little pieces in uh, the exact right spot so they interact correctly with each other was uh, quite a hassle. On top we find three little mock pins and this bulged material because everyone likes a nice bulge. Nice. I cut out a piece of steel in this shape and tick welded it to the receiver and then filed and sanded everything to the final shape. That also took ages and had to be done very carefully uh, because I didn't want to damage the edges of the receiver of course. The charging handle is also made from steel and is spring loaded like the original. The Picatinny rails are made from aluminum and are screwed into the receiver. I also made these from scratch because yeah, Picatinny blanks in this size are pretty expensive. And the front side is made from steel as well and like the original is secured by a spring loaded steel ball inside of the front side. It's fully functional and completely adjustable. <laughs> it's kind of funny, now these parts are described with a couple of words but it took hours and hours to make. For example, this little opening right here uh, that was completely hand filed. Uh, I made every pin on my old trusty lathe which isn't that accurate so I had to creep up uh, by a tenth of a tenth of a millimeter every time. It was so much work. And finally we have the distinctive carry handle that adds so much to the overall look of the gun. Like the original it is also milled from aluminum and also houses the rear side and acts as razor for uh, optic for example. In fact, it is much more comfortable to shoot with uh, the side mounted on top of the carry handle uh, instead of directly to the gun. The carry handle, like the rest of the gun, is mostly painted with a special color that creates a beautiful matte satin finish that is super close to the original and is also very scratch resistant. Not on the level of Cerakote, but sturdy enough for field use. I can apply and work with Cerakote, I did many times. So I experimented with uh, different colors and techniques but none reached the look of the finish like this paint. Gun bluing was not an option uh, as I used a lot of welding on the upper receiver and the welding material reacted different uh, to the acid uh, than the rest of the body. I used gun blue on parts that have to handle a lot of friction though like um, 
screws, pins, levers, the rear side, sling mount and switches for example. The rear side is also completely mated by me from steel and is fully functional. I still need to laser engrave the lettering into it, uh, same goes for the serial number on the side of the receiver by the way. The slider rides on this little ramp underneath the rear side, which accounts for different ammo types actually. Uh, it's a quite a cool design and it took a little bit to figure this thing out. Finally we have the muscle devices. The shack can be equipped with a short suppressor. Uh, which is more for flash mitigation and signature reduction. I decided to make this piece from aluminum uh, as it's much easier for me to machine and I didn't want to make this thing unplayable by <laughs> adding even more weight. I was super keen about getting the quick lock mechanism working as on the real thing and I did, which is super cool. You just press the buttons and you can remove it and immediately reattach it. Uh, or swap for another device. Uh, I haven't made the flash hider yet as I found these impressors to be so much cooler and yeah I uh, wanted to make those first. The big suppressor on the other hand is screwed on the barrel to then lock into the same mechanism. On the real chuck the big suppressor offers a significant noise reduction actually. A fun side fact the big suppressor is made from a RPG26 fiberglass tube. Same goes for the suppressor on the VKS V-Club sniper rifle by the way. I made mine from a fiber resin composite as well and it's very light but sturdy as hell. Sadly I was way too late at the range at the day we were filming uh, the intro and by the time we were done it was nearly dark and I was not able to get the planned shooting and performance part on camera. So I did highly sophisticated and scientific tests in my workshop which included a chrono test which didn't work because uh, my chrono gave up after the first PB. The standardized American sniper sniping test of shooting a trash bag from two meters away. And measuring the speed of the rifle on a flat surface, which is about 3.4 centimeters in five seconds. But yeah, the gun shoots 25 BBs per second, which I might want to reduce a little bit. The energy is constant at 0.49 joule and the accuracy is quite good but with such velocity secondary of course. I apologize for the shit part of the video but I'll put out some gameplay videos at some point including one with the Shack 12. So yeah, that's it. My masterpiece. I worked for nearly 4 years on this thing. The steel work alone took about 450 hours. Some of you might wonder, hey can I buy this gun? And no you can't. <laughs> this is my personal masterpiece, I will not sell it. Would I build another? Probably. But I am not able to price that thing at something even remotely realistic. I mean yeah, we can do the simple math. If I take 20 bucks an hour, which is below the average hourly pay where I live, I still have to price the steelwork alone at roughly 9k. And then you have to throw the internals and the materials in the mix and yeah, you see where it's going. It's, just, it's really impossible to price that thing at something that is remotely realistic. And yeah, that is certainly also the reason why we get one M4 and AK after another from the big airsoft manufacturers, because it is extremely costly to create something like this on an industrial level. And if you try that with an incredibly niche weapon like this, which only has a very small circle of potential buyers, yeah, you see where this is going. A friend of mine is actually working in airsoft manufacturing and he once told me in order for Suma to sell one of these AKs, those cheaper AKs, for around $100 from the factory, they have to produce at least 1 million pieces. And to throw another big number in the room, for example, if you want to engineer and mill out the molds for the injection molding of the plastic for the Shack 12, you'll be easily at 130k. Easily. And that is sadly the reason why big airsoft manufacturers don't build niche airsoft guns for a small circle of potential customers. But I said nay, I am my own manufacturer now. So yeah, this piece was also a dedication and test to my own skill. To see if I'm able to bring an idea of such complexity to life. And the answer is yes, which makes me extremely proud. It's just a good feeling to look at something you build and feel nothing but joy. Of course I'm already working on the next gun. Very soon you will see a one-to-one -one grozer with all its parts and its functions. 
And further, I'm planning on a GBB Val, a GBB VSS, an AN94, ADS, amphibious rifle, APS underwater rifle, PB pistol. Yeah, I have a big variety of guns which I can build and I will build. I'm at a point where I can create pretty much anything I want and that is a very exciting feeling. And if you're interested in my future projects, you should hit the subscribe button. I'll make it worth it, I promise. So yeah, before I end this video, I still want to give a gigantic thank you to my Patreons. I'm very well aware that I was gone for quite a while and it's even more surprising to see so many people still over there and supporting me. I'm not sure, maybe they forgot to cancel their subscription, <laughs> but no, uh, I know that there are many people who supported me from the very beginning and I am incredibly thankful for that. Thank you guys. With that being said, I see you soon. Bye bye.